Hey all, hope all is well. This is another video in the Road to Grandmaster series. And this one I'm going to be covering my round one game from the Southwest class, um, which took place in, da in just outside of Dallas, Texas. Um, if you've been following some of the recent videos, you know that I had just finished up this tournament uh, in Portugal and actually went pretty well. I finished on um, six, and, six and a half out of nine and I very narrowly missed a Grandmaster norm. So I was hoping to keep uh, the continuity going and show some good chess here. Um, the tournament in uh, Texas was actually, I think, about a week after, um, a little less than a week after the Portugal one ended. So there wasn't a lot of time to like relax, and I really was uh, just getting back into tournament road very quickly. So in this game, I was uh, black um, against uh, an FM named Doug Eckert. Um, and, uh, you know, as is the case in opens, you know, essentially you typically uh, play down the first uh, few rounds. And if you do well, you give yourself a shot to, uh, to uh, do more than that. So anyways, uh, Doug played E4. I played E6. Uh, D4, D5, Knight D2. Um, and we have ourselves a Terrish French. Um, the Terrish is the second most popular line against the French, um, with you know the main line being knight c3. What are the differences? Well, if, when you play knight d2, first of all, you're cutter, cutting out the French winnower, which would happen after the knight comes to c3 and bishop b4. But more importantly than that, after knight c3, which is the typical line, when white goes knight f6 and e5, Black has very quick counterplay on the d4 pawn because the knight on c3 is kind of in the way of the c3 pawn, uh, c2 pawn reinforcing it on c3. So as a consequence of those factors, the argument with knight d2 in some sense is that now if you play knight f5 and then e5 is played, now white is ready to just play c3 and reinforce that pawn structure right away. So it's kind of like a a better version of those other positions if you go for the closed positions. So because of this feature, um, although this is playable, this e5, knight, F, knight fd7, even in this structure, um, most white, uh, most black players go for c5, and that's what I wound up doing. The idea is to uh, take away some one of the, the drawbacks, address one of the drawbacks of the knight on d2, which is that from d2, it's actually not eyeing the d5 pawn and not quite influencing the center in the same way. It's not the most active square. So the idea with c5 is you can actually rip open the center right away because the knight is, does not have that pressure on the d5 pawn. So e takes d5 was played. This is uh, the most popular move. And here black has a decision to take with the e pawn or to take with the queen. Um, if you take with the e pawn, um, typically what happens is you have uh, positions where black is saddled with an isolated pawn. Um, but uh, in return, black may have like essentially some some active pieces in play, and the lines typically go like this. Um, uh, and you can see uh, black has one extra pawn island, isolated pawn, very nagging uh, positional advantage for white. But black in return has active pieces, um, and uh, uh, there have been many many games in this line. Um, uh, one of the biggest practitioners. Uh, of the past was uh, Victor Korchnoi. Um, very, very impressive on this line. And I will say one thing about Korchnoi and the French Terrish. He never lost to Karpov in this line. And I think that's the, uh, with black, and I think that's one of the biggest endorsements you can give for a black line um, is that you don't lose to one of the more positional world champions we've ever had that love to needle you in situations just like this. So I think that's something worth pointing out. So anyways, um, instead of e takes d5, I went queen takes d5. Queen takes d5 is the modern approach, you can say. Um, it's taken hold in the past 10 to 15 years. Um, and the idea is, you know what? Uh, I don't want to play with the isolated pawn. Um, and instead, I'm going to allow my development to lag a little bit just to keep that structural advantage. Um, these positions uh, are very, very similar to Sicilian positions in a way because black has a king side uh, pawn majority um, and end games tend to be pretty decent for black. But uh, because um, white is ahead in development, um, black has to kind of negate the attacking chances that white has before really thinking about having uh, being on footing where they can play for a win. 
So after queen takes d5, knight g5 is played. This is theory. Uh, c takes d4, and then bishop c4. Um, and again, this has all been played before. And I went queen d7. Um, queen d7 is a move. Queen d6 is a move. Even queen d8 is a move. They're all just retreating the queen and keeping an eye on the d4 pawn. Uh, castles, knight c6, knight b3, and a6. And the idea here is, again, to kind of eye the b5 square in many lines is important, and even think about b5. Um, and note that the d4 pawn here, this extra pawn, is going to be lost. There's no, uh, no way around it, and black has no business actually trying to protect it. Um, note that a move like e5 actually just loses on the spot to various things. I think knight g5 is the most dangerous, but also even rook e1 is dangerous. Um, note that if even if you play a move like rook e1, not only are you threatening knight takes e5, you're also just threatening knight b takes d4 because of the pin uh, that the rook has on this king. So e5 is a losing move. You just don't want that. And again, knight g5 here, just hitting f7 is pretty much a nightmare. I mean, no pun intended. <laughs> So um, because of that, after knight b3, you go a6. And then white played a4, which is a bit of a, a sideline. It's not something I really looked at super hard. Um, it does prevent b5, but it also wastes a little bit of time. So I thought, okay, um, I probably should just get on with my development and catch up. So I went knight f6. White now went queen e2. And this move actually very much surprised me. I thought that... Uh, White was just going to recapture the pawn d4, but what White is actually trying to do is saying, you know what, I want to recapture with my rook on the d1 square so that uh, uh, my, your queen will have to worry about moving again. Um, very fair argument, very, very fair argument. So queen e2, uh, bishop d6, just developing that bishop to the long diagonal. Um, rook d1, castles, knight takes d4, recovering that pawn. Um, and now I went queen c7, and the idea with queen c7 was to step out of the way of this rook on the d file and ex potentially exert pressure on this diagonal on the h2 pawn. Additionally, my queen is also eyeing the c4 bishop, and it's not hanging right now, but just eyeing that bishop means the queen has to kind of keep an eye on it. Um, bishop g5 was played, uh, hitting my knight, and I went... Knight takes d4, rook takes d4, and here was the first really critical position of the game for me because basically white still has this lead in development. The rook is really nicely centralized. Um, the bishop is kind of biting on granite right now, but um, white has you know pretty much five pieces very active, um, and I just have three, right, um, of my own. Uh, I'll make those red. And... I have the one thing I have going for me is I pretty much have the better pawn structure here. My kingside pawn majority is very healthy, and um, yeah, if the, if the queens were off the board here, I'd probably be in very secure shape. Um, although there is rook a d1, which would you know take over the the open d file, so maybe even that's a little bit unclear. All that being said, I also have to be concerned because white has this lead development and my king come under, coming under fire really quickly. So you can imagine something like rook h4 being something that's scary. Um, also, bishop takes f6, crippling my pawn structure is something that is a little bit scary and worth thinking about. And the issue is, is if I just move my bishop back to protect that uh, knight, it's kind of not helping me develop or get my pieces active. So in this position, I really had to make a decision about whether I was going to allow bishop at takes f6 or not. And then secondarily, how do I get out the rest of my pieces? Because I need to connect my rooks. That is the sign of good development, connecting your rooks. After a little bit of thought, um, it became clear to me that I should allow bishop takes f6 and try to get on with my development as quickly as possible. And once I saw that, the move became really clear to me. <coughs> uh, and I played e5. The idea is that I open the bishop on c8 to develop, I challenge the rook with tempo, and um, yeah, I, I just start to initiate in the center before white can get the other rook on a1 in the game. Um, rook h4 was played, very aggressive-minded to keep the uh, keep some initiative on the king side, 
and I did anticipate this move. I mean, the, the rook only had the uh, that h4 square on the fourth rank, so if it wanted to stay there, it had to go to h4. And now, again, I have to be a little bit worried about this potential capture on f6, my h7 pawn being sensitive, maybe the queen even coming to e4, the bishop to d3. And really, you just see all in all those lines that this diagonal is very sensitive once my knight is lost. So what I decide to do is pretty much cover that diagonal best I could while continuing developing, and I did that with bishop f5. I thought this was a really nice move, and I was quite pleased when I saw this. The point is that after this capture on f6, which did happen, not only do I reinforce my pawn on e5, so now this pawn structure, this pawn due on the center, means I have really good control of the central squares. I am also have this bishop tucked away, uh, potentially going to g6 soon, so that my king side is reinforced and my bishop almost acts like a g-pawn. So I'm kind of just making sure I, I secure my king, and now you can also see my rooks are connected. So e5 and bishop f5 was a pretty big time maneuver for just stabilizing my position. White played bishop d3 to try to challenge that bishop. Um, uh, of course, taking would be very bad because if I take on d3 after queen takes, again, this diagonal would just be devastating for me. So I need to go back, and I did that with bishop g6. Again, just securing... Uh, uh, my h7 square and just this diagonal. And now the double pawns don't look as bad as they uh, seem because this bishop is also um, almost like another pawn. Uh, rook c4 now was played challenging my queen and I think kind of acknowledging that I kind of patched up my king side in a pretty good way. Um, instead, one might consider rook g4. I think that was a little bit more tenacious. Um, because now you introduce ideas of potentially shifting the knight over to f5 and getting to those light squares. Because what we're going to see in this position is this knight really is dominated by my pawns on e5 and f6, um, really restricting it from getting into the game. And as long as the knight is in the way here, also the queen has a hard time getting to the king side and putting more pressure on me. So rook c4 kind of missed the mark a little bit. I moved my queen, I went... I had two real choices here I seriously considered. One was queen d7 and one was queen b6. Um, the line I was looking at with queen b6 I thought was interesting because uh, I'm attacking the b2 pawn, but I reasoned that it was a little bit too risky to bring my queen, drag my queen far away from the king. Um, I've said this before, but when the king and the is far away from the queen or vice versa, a lot of times that's when the attacks really work out. So I was uh, really concerned about a line where White it just ignores the b2 pawn and just plays knight h4, queen takes b2, rook e1, and then potentially shifts all the attention um, to the king side where I'm not really ready. Now, a computer will play this type of line very willingly, no, no problem. But again, for the human player, um, I just thought it wasn't worth it to play with fire. So instead of queen b6, I went queen d7. And that was my other idea um, in the position was to just keep an eye on this light square, this all-important f5 square, because that's where I'm sensitive right now. Um, my pawn on my pawns on f6 and e5 are doing a good job holding together uh, dark squares, but my light squares are pretty sensitive. So, queen e7, knight h4, uh, again reasonable move, step in the right direction, getting uh, attacking those light squares, and now I went f5 and. Now I think I'm I'm pretty much okay because I'm I'm doing a good job of keeping things under control. Note that if I played a relatively nonchalant move, let's say like rook b8 for instance, white could consider playing a move like queen f3 and all of a sudden this light square, the light squares are chronically weak. Um, now maybe a case where I can kind of play around the light squares where I can try to trade some pieces and if the knight f5, I can go bishop f8 and just kind of hold things together. But I do have to worry about h4 and eventual potential h5. And I also just have to worry about a piece sitting on f5 and bothering me with um, to decisive effect at some point. So instead of allowing a piece to occupy that square, white piece, I thought, you know what, now's the time to just take it myself. And now I also have this idea of seizing the light squares with e4. Um, I thought I was kind of taking over the initiative here. 
Now, Knight takes g6 was played, and I thought that was a serious, serious mistake. Reason being is that now you kind of help my pawn structure a little bit and give myself dynamic chances. Now, I think there, I mean, there are two ways to capture here, and it might not be clear to the audience which is the best way to capture. So I'm going to give you five seconds to pause the video and try to think about what's the right way to capture that knight. All right, hopefully you got a chance to pause the video, take a little think about it. And I think the capture might surprise you. Um, I went H takes G6. Um, now you might ask why H takes G6. You had an opportunity to have no double pawns with F takes G6. And isn't this what you want, having this really healthy pawn structure like this? Um, and the answer is actually H takes G6 is better for a few reasons. First of all, if you examine f takes g6 for a moment, my light squares are a little bit weak because the f7 pawn has been pushed. So you can see all these light squares are kind of loose. And even though black has a nice center and I could just step up king g7, um, there might be a scenario where the rook goes to h4 and then bishop c4 check comes and white has a lot of counterplay on the light squares. The second piece is actually when you play f takes g6, the seventh rank is wide open. Um, and so in end games, um, there might be a scenario where, you know, rook gets the seventh rank and my king is kind of naked and can't be appropriately shielded from checks. Um, you always want to think about the pawn structures that can arise in end games when you're making decisions in the middle game. It's just a, a good thing to do. The last point, and um, uh, probably the most important point, is actually after h takes g6, the move I made, I also give myself dynamic chances on the h-file. So when I, if I step up with king g7 and go rook h8, the open h-file could be a real asset for me, connected with my bishop lined up against h2. So all these factors uh, led me to play h takes g6 pretty much instantly. I mean, there wasn't even a thought process there. But I think it's kind of muscle memory and understanding that get, just told me, told my intuition that this is where the dynamic should be. Now, in this position also, I still have this e4 threat. And you can see that in the opposite colored bishop position, it's really going to be who has better control of the center and whose bishop is actually more effect effective because uh, both our bishops are unopposed. And I thought in this position, with my pawn set up on light squares here, my bishop should be more effective than, uh, than white's. Um, additionally, even if white was able to play g3 and set up and blunt my bishop on this diagonal, I may have the c5 diagonal go to and hammer down on f2. So I thought that I was just in better shape to get something going. So my opponent played rook h4, moving the rook back. But we can see now that like between rook c4 and then rook h4 back, um, this was kind of not the best maneuver. I went queen e7, which I was uh, I thought was a good move, hitting this rook on h4 because I do acknowledge that you know there could be some idea of queen e3 and queen h6, and to really just avoid that, I want to keep an eye on this rook. So very important for me to play that before I played e4. Um, so I played queen e7, rook h3. The rook goes back to the square, a little bit passive, not. And you can see Rook's, uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Danny King here from Power Play Chess. Uh, connected Rooks are really a problem. Um, and so this Rook on H3 and this Rook on A1, um, it might not present itself as a problem right away, but you might, you're might you going to find a lot of times that tactically connected Rooks can be an issue. So I will say this, white does have a threat. Um, if it's white to move, again, it is not. Thankfully, it's black to move. But if it was white to move, bishop takes f5 is a serious threat. Note that if I make a move like rook b8, um, bishop takes f5, g takes f5, and there are two ways to win. One is just rook g3 check, uh, king h7, and then queen h5 is, is actually mate. Um, actually, that's just the simplest way. The other way I was thinking about is just queen h5 right away. And now the problem is, is that uh, white is threatening mate in two ways, queen h7 mate and queen h8 mate. Um, so uh, I could parry the mate with a move like f6, but I mean, this is not very serious because now rook g3 picks up the queen. 
So again, you always have to be alert um, for tactics. And uh, I want to play e4, so I, I saw this idea, but bishop takes f5 was a serious threat. So I went for e4, um, getting that bishop off that diagonal, and you can see how my pawn chain here is really, really nice, all on light squares restricting the bishop on d3. Uh, queen e3 was played. I anticipated this move, actually. The idea of the queen getting to h6, giving up this bishop on d3 because there are two mating squares. There's h7 and there's h8. Um, to deal with that, I played rook fc8, a move I'm, I really, really like because now that my rook gets off of the f8 square, um, my king has an escape score in f8, and I only need to worry about covering the h8 square. So for instance, if queen h6 threatening mate... I can just go queen f6, and or even better than queen f6, uh, bishop e5. And the beauty of this is that after queen h7 check, it's just one check. I go to f8, and my bishop holds the squares on this diagonal together. Um, note that I, I said queen f6 instead of... Um, I said bishop e5 instead of queen e6, because if I go queen f6, this check actually allows black to trade, a white to trade some pieces, and I kind of want to keep the queens on the board. I have aggressive intentions here. Although I will say this endgame would still be winning because even after this trade, the bishop has to get off the c2 pawn, and now my rook comes in. I have bishop c5, I'm hitting f2, b2 is hanging, and you could just see that um, the opposite colored bishop's position is very favorable to me because I'm the side that, that is attacking. Uh, one other feature I'll note about this type of setup, um, uh, and I, again, I'm going to make my move rook fc8, is that a lot of times we're, you know, taught when we're younger, told, um, you know, you should have your pawns on the opposite color square as the opponent's bishop. And the reason for that is because you don't want your pawns to be targets in the end game. But what I've actually found through practice is you actually want to keep the pawns around your king on the same color squares as the opponent's bishop so that that bishop actually lacks scope, attacking scope on, uh, towards your king. So that's actually something that's very important to remember. So you see this light squared bishop, right? All my pawns on the king side are on light squares because it restricts the mobility of that bishop. So something that's kind of important to know and just keep in, keep in mind because um, I think it's not explained very well. So anyways, uh, the bishop has to move if queen h6, I have uh, bishop e5. So um, bishop f1 was played. And now I just went rook takes d2, just took that pawn because you can see again that I can just parry the threat uh, of queen h6 by getting the bishop on the on the uh, diagonal, on the dark square diagonal. So now I'm up a pawn. Uh, my rook is on the second rank. And you can see uh, now bishop c5 is even a legitimate threat because and f2 is loose. So black is actually has a winning position here. Um, I'm also attacking b2. I just am too active, and you can see white's lacking coordination right now. White played queen b3, challenging my rook, and I went rook a c8, just doubling. Um, no problems here. Note this bishop still can't enter the game because my rooks are both eyeing that square. And then rook d1. Um, Fine, a, a reasonable move, but again, you can see that white lacks coordination. All these pieces are in very weird spots and are not working together, whereas all my pieces that are synergized. Um, another thing that's important to point out is all my pieces are actually protected, and you're going to find in you know many games um, if you the side that has unprotected pieces is usually disadvantaged. Um, so I really made sure to keep all my coordination going well here. It's one of those rare moments where everything in the position is protected. So I went bishop e5 now trying to attack the b2 pawn. Now my queen is unprotected, but hey, I had that moment of harmony, so you can at least appreciate that. And I'm just trying to run rampant on the second rank. Queen d5, um, centralizing the queen, but I'm not sure what it's really doing there. So I just took another pawn, rook takes b2. And now I'm just two pawns up, so um, this should just be over quickly. g4 was played, and again, g4 is not a move you want to make. It doesn't even make a lot of sense or makes no sense. But my opponent was in serious time trouble now and kind of, I think, saw the writing on the wall. And when that happens, sometimes you start to flail. 
Um, I took that pawn. It's a third pawn. Um, I can capture a tempo, so why not? And now rook e3. And okay, uh, my e4 pawn is hanging, but I'm three pawns up. Now the king side is very weak, and so I just went in for it. I started with queen f6, threatening queen takes f2, uh, and then checkmate on h2. And that has to be addressed. So bishop e2 was happened. And now in this position, I went for the knockout blow. Um, I'll give you five seconds to uh, pause the video and try and figure out what that was. All right, hopefully you got a chance to, uh, to see, uh, figure out what the line is. Um, it's not super complicated, and, but I did, I did double check it just to make sure. And the move was bishop takes h2 check. Um, the point is, is that, um, you know, essentially if king takes h2, queen takes f2 check, and I just pick off the rook. And uh, yeah, it's just totally over. Um, White played king f1, stepping out the way for a moment. And I did actually look at these lines because these lines require a little bit more work. Um, the point is that um, White is saying, you know what, how do you finish me off? So I was like, okay, if White doesn't, doesn't accept the bishop, how do you do it? And you do it by playing g3. Again, renewing a uh, checkmating threat, queen takes f2. And really just a tough spot to be in because the king is so, so naked now. F3 was played, um, trying to get out the way for a moment, and I thought here, man, this king is so open. There must be a forced win with my rook coming in, blah, blah, blah. And I found it with g2 check, actually. Um, point is to distract the king, get it away from the e2 bishop. And after king takes g2 check, the finale, rook takes e2. Um, another force check you pretty much need to capture. Rook takes e2. And then queen takes f3 check. And now I'm picking off the rook with check. Um, I'm going to be several pawns up. And mate is will be in the cards shortly. All right. So that was a fun game to play. Um, White resigned here. Um, definitely fun game to play. It was nice to get an uh, interesting terrorist position and respond well. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, just got off to... Uh, a good start in the first round. Um, all right. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, please like or subscribe to the channel. And if you want to support the Road to Grandmaster Journey, you can do so uh, by checking out the PayPal link in the description below. Thanks.